Thank you so much. That was, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, yes, doesn't this, I don't know, who know, who, do you remember Romper Room? Oh, yes. You remember that? It's, I know it's, it's, uh, it has the little uh, drum thingy, so, you know, you can't actually see my face, but I feel like you can. We're going to just lower this. Everybody can still hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so this, uh, this collection of poems, Oh Canada, Crack My Heart, it's not exactly forthcoming because uh, nobody has said that they would publish it yet. But eventually, I hope, it will forthcome. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much, in fact. I'm going to read, and then I'll see if I feel like saying anything about the poems. They're quite new. I mean, some of them have been, some of them have been somehow in my life for mm, between six to ten years. Several of them were written in the last six months. So the collection is, um, it covers a lot of ground, it covers a lot of territory, but as, as Rona said, they're, they're, they're poems about about my own life in Canada and this this world, which, considering my last three or four books, is is new material for me to, to write about my Canadian experience. I'll begin and end with poems called O Canada. O Canada, as sung on Vancouver Island. Another spring cracks open on the rocks as the seagull drops living muscles on stone shore, alights to tear the flesh. I know the fierce gull. I know the creature torn from its shell. Amidst the carnage, the sea laps, laps, licks the stone foot of the house. See like a beast, see like a beast, I know. When I was a child, it almost killed me. The one who went before, my mermaid sister, drowned. Yet I have learned to love water. The ocean beyond measure, every sea, the river of my birth, the lake that pulled me under into memory. Finally, we love the beast that lets us live. Red tulips burn above the bay. Rock crest hangs purple and white. Yellow daffodils sing an idiot song of color. I can't understand it, can't understand this beauty, foreign, bright, gaudy. Nothing is real here. I am not real. My head floats past my feet and I cannot retrieve it. Oh, Canada. I try so hard with you, but nothing explains your terrible, polite immensity, your merciless wind, your deaths, which are my own. Not to suggest that a country is a family, but stating it unequivocally, a country is a family, and this is mine, my country, my family. I come back to them now as water always comes back. It is the dead who teach us how to live. It is the dead who teach us how to swim, well or badly. It is the dead who walk among us but cannot spell our names. I stand on the shore looking at the mainland, trapped between coming home and leaving it, knowing like the convict that something must change or nothing ever will. O oh, Canada, Canada, I regard the dark water as coldly as it regards me. The seals do not speak human, the herons neither. I no longer understand what I am, what is my language. I only know one thing. If I do not speak the truth on my own cold shore, then I cannot swim well through this world.
One of the things that uh, I'm struggling with in this collection is how to write poems that are about difficult subjects, both personal and more public, more political, like, like the, the murders committed by Robert Picton. And do it in such a way that I that I don't that I don't alienate the reader with the with the horrific material of the poems themselves, and I don't think that I've been quite s successful yet. So you can uh, let me know later on. Um, that's that's actually some of the you know conversations that I'm having with people who are reading the poems now. How to how to, how to approach that material. This is called the breakfast cereal of his youth. Why, I asked, is it called crack? Because, my brother began, a smile on his face like the smirk of a scientist explaining the solar system to a peasant. Because it crackles when you cook it up and suck it in, snap, crackle, pop. The smoke swirls, the pipe so hot you burn your mouth. The hotter, the higher, the faster. Because it gives you cracked lips. Because if you smoke too much, it cracks your heart to smithereens. Because it cracks your life neatly into before and after the first inhalation. It takes 10 seconds for the pleasure flood of dopamine to drown the brain. Flood of no return. The arc cracks against the rocks. Little white rocks. Again, the patronizing smile. How handsome he is. Silk boy amongst gangsters. Smooth. When he speaks, he is half devil and all hunger. This is before the years in prison whittled down his face. Give me this, he said. How could he have known he was asking for death? Give me this. As children, we heard that request night after night. Give me this. Bottle clank, clink of ice, blood on dad's shirt after a fight. Do you remember that? Sallow light of his room, early morning or dusk. The white shirt on the floor, stained brown. The stench of cigarette smoke, old and new. The rest of the house, a long way off. It will kill you, I tell him. He shrugs. Snap, crackle, pop. Black eyes turn and lock into my own, click, click, like a gun ready to use. To stare into him is to stare into myself, my father, the future like a tunnel, the creosote darkness, the coming roar. And this is called just the idea. And in some ways, this poem would like to be something else, like a stage play or a conversation on a play, uh, on a stage between two women. But I can only really get the one woman. The other woman, I, I can't quite get her. <laughs> I can't quite find her. And that's the other, that's the woman who's actually asking the questions. Just the idea. He always liked to fuck them in his SUV. He also had an Alfa, Alfa Romeo. But there is more room in an SUV to hog tie a woman and move her carcass around, even if she is not a crack whore. I read something at the Y about those girls in Juarez, and they aren't even prostitutes. They're factory workers making shit for Americans. So what? A crack horse should get murdered? Well, no, that's not what I meant. But it happens. I mean, we know it happens. When you're working, you have that in your mind. 
like an occupational hazard. Precisely. That's why I carry a knife, and I know how to use it. Anyway, to fuck us, he would, ta he would take us to a deserted stretch in Ogden, or all the way out of town, the girl could give him head while he drove. Sometimes he would just listen to music to get in the mood. Emma said he liked ABBA. <laughs> that really wrecked Mamma Mia for me. <laughs> anyway, after he finishes, she hops out of the car to pee. Without her shoes on, of course. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered if she'd been wearing them. They were stilettos. How far can you walk in those? Still, it's just the idea. Emma is squatting when he starts the car. Spinning tires spit gravel at her thighs. Hey, what the fuck? Where are you going? The car pulls around, loops back onto the highway, aimed like a dick into Calgary, which is exactly where the asshole went. Left her standing there. No shoes, no underwear under her skirt. Emma? Her name was Emma? Yeah, she was a lawyer's daughter. Strathcona, the private school, riding lessons, the works. I won't tell you what Daddy and his partners used to do to her. That's another story. Anyway, there she was, walking back to Calgary, barefoot at midnight, scared shitless like someone sicker than scared shitless of someone sicker than the asshole who left her there. Only drunk Indians and women with a death, death wish hitchhike that late at night. By the time she got far enough in to catch a bus, her feet bled all over the floor, and the driver told her to go to the hospital. At least he let her stay on the bus. When she got back downtown, she was crying like a baby. I took her to the hospital myself in Grandma's old Bronco. I was living in it at the time. That was a good truck. Rusted out piece of shit, but valiant, you know? I loved that truck. A real truck, not a fucking SUV. At the hospital, the nurse asked Emma if she had been tortured. She was crying again because they had to open up all the cuts to clean them out. But for some reason, that question made us both laugh. Later, I thought about it a lot. It's a good question to ask in Canada, in a smart-ass money-bag city, brimming men with fancy cars, a fancy for crack whores. I wanted the nurse to ask me, have you been tortured? Give me a minute, nurse. Let me make a list. What, do you think that the rich, well-married pillars of society don't want our skinny asses? They love the smell of desperation. My beat at night is like a foreign car auction. God, I loved that truck. And this is called Patriotism on the Banks of the Bow River. And just, uh, just in this neighborhood, when we were walking over here, Rona pointed out uh, a place called The Mission, where homeless people can go and take shelter and spend the night. And one of the really depressing things that's happening in Calgary is that um, in an effort to beautify the downtown core, a lot of the uh, um, a lot of the homeless people and poor people, yeah, not even homeless, just poor people, have been driven out of the city center, following, you know, echoing things that have happened in many North American cities and European cities over the last, you know, two hundred years. Um, but like here in Calgary as well, a lot of the services for those people are downtown. So 
what the city has done basically is rendered all these people incredibly, incredibly vulnerable because they've been driven into neighborhoods where there are no homeless shelters and there are no, you know, public clinics for them and safe houses, basically. Um, and this is called Patriotism on the Banks of the Bow River, or There Goes the Neighborhood. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. My home on native land. That's what we used to sing as kids, ignorant of the arrow's lethal point. There's no way to work it out carefully. You have to tear through the flesh to get free. Then there'll be blood all over the goddamn backseat of the car again. It's so good to be back in Calgary. The brutal downtown streets beside the beautiful cold river. <laughs> I realize that I am just confirming every eastern redneck stereotype, or rather every eastern stereotype of redneck Albertans. But you know, stereotypes exist. <clears throat> I see they have ripped down the neighborhood where the poor people lived to make room for well-appointed condos. I don't blame them. The riverside is prime real estate. There are duplexes and trailer parks in Forest Lawn and Ogden for the parasites. Though it is a long, complicated bus ride back downtown, especially for the working girls, but they'll manage somehow. Someone will give them a ride. I thought my youngest sister, the crack addict, not the cop, was exaggerating. I often hope she exaggerates the bad news, but as usual, she was telling the truth. The neighborhood is mostly gone, and what is not gone is wrecked. The bulldozers are silent on Sunday. Sunk in mud, rotten wood, tar paper shingles. The houses are gone now. The people gone. Along with their useless history. What is the use of a people's history? What is the use of my own life half gone? The past shed, empty and dry like snakeskin behind me. Get thee behind me, memory, is a long, writhing animal. Sinuous container, shockingly quick to strike. Faces place in the attic of the old house. Messy rendition of feathers, bones, books. Weasel skull, bird skull, black whorls of horse's hair. Suddenly, 25 years ago, her masks took shape on the scarred floor, then stared at us from the walls like the wild creatures we wanted to become and became. I witnessed her bring in the weird materials, watched her nocturnal comings and goings, learned the measure of the night without her, but woke to find water boiling for tea, her boots on the stained floor, the smell of the river cold and wolf willowy come into the room like a wolf with her. We did not care about the broken lock. Fool hardy, I think we wanted it smashed. Let the doors swing off their hinges, let the wind blow in with the crazy men, let the wind stay. I had seventeen to her eighteen years, both of us gone from home early and hungry for usage, scraping our chins, knees, knuckles against the world. The world showed through sharper in those hard streets than in the classrooms, the six-dollar jobs, the orderly downtown kingdom to the west, where we watched men pound steel and glass into the sky, and loved the pure dangerous industry of it, the metal and power that we would not have a place inside. That world gone between the racetrack and the river. That time of immense inarticulable lusts, while men around us articulated their horniness just fine, coughed a feel, leaned in close, grabbed a piece of flesh to make sure we grasped their generosity in not taking it all. Face and I lay on the dirty attic floor with scalding tea 
talking long Camus night lines into the quiet dark, into the unquiet dark. Someone was usually screaming in those houses, and at night I worried for the children I watched during the day, flint-faced, bruised, scraped chins and knees, ancient, worn-out kids, weathered by six or eight or ten years of storm. A sullen boy kicked a ball against a chain-link chain -link fence, made a sound like aborted lightning while a girl licked salt out of an empty bag of chips, her wrists extended bruised from dirty sleeves, their eyes, their eyes, beyond the stone of accusation, the familiar request for alms, give me love, give me love, love and love, then food. Yet the autumn light came morning after morning, untangled from the aspens like gold yarn, led us out of the maze of night onto the sagging porch, where cream men smoked and grew quiet, variously broken, sometimes badly scarred, black-eyed, but quiet now, maybe venturing to ask if we had milk for tea. One of them was a good carver, I was too shy to talk to him, but admired the powerful hands, the tools on the porch rail, the gray dust in a ring before him on his clothes, his face, as though he had carved himself out of rock and risen into weary human form. Everyone on the street knew Agatha, the old lady with weak old tea bags, searching for butts in the gutter. Once I brought her a box of Tetleys, and the gratitude almost gave her a heart attack. How she stank! What a wild, sweet rose she was! A girl still rose in her swallow's cry, not the throaty cackle you expected, black eyes with blue-rimmed pupils. I believe she was still alive in her house, twig scarecrow in a holy sweater, when a bladed machine plowed the place down, buried her under moldy drywall and newspapers and paper cups and garbage. Honestly, when I picked through the mess in the mud yesterday, I found faces old street only because I could hear Agatha underground screaming, those selfish pricks at, pricks at City Hall, they'll never get me out of here. Not a door or window left of that time. Nothing to walk back inside. Only recollections of people scattered, nameless. What is the use of a people's history? Two bulldozers, a backhoe, grey sky, early snow, a bum stumbles by, stinking old god with bandages on blackened hands. I stand in the frozen mud, wondering how to enter again that unlikely gentleness, the cracked ribcage of the world, as if it were the last shelter. It is always the last shelter. How could we forget? No, that one's really too depressing. Forget it, I'm not going to read it. You know, you're nice people. We've just met. <laughs> yeah, just uh, save that one for the book. It's called One Little Indian. I caught minnows between river stones. I walked and slept in fields outside Medicine Hat, Red Deer, Wetaskiwin, Athabasca, camped in the Kananaskis, leaned against the mountain, and stared into the green opal light of Lake Minnewanka. I sat bawling outside the Blackfoot truck stop, and walked home in the dark on Crowchild, Sarsi Trail. Sarsi Trail was the warpath for downtown. I wondered about the words Shaganapi and Paskapu. Indian names, my mother explained, Indian lands, sitting in the backyard drinking a beer, 
She looked around at our trees and said, This was all theirs once. They lived here before we did. What a gift she had, my mother, for casually blowing the minds of her children. If the Indians had once lived in our backyard, where did they go when we moved in? Where were the Indians? Sometimes I rode a horse from the stables along the Sarsi Reserve. I saw the trees. I saw the barbed wire. But I never saw a Sarsi. Or did I? The only Indian at school was Ryan, bigger than the other kids. Merciless grabber of girls' breasts and thighs, he made us cry to give himself an echo, to let us hear how he had sounded when ripped through the crux of himself. I liked him. Attraction is recognition, and his will was my familiar. I tasted his rebellion, swallowed his howls as they leapt off the brick walls. After an insult, I screamed at him, Kiss my ass! He came loping across the field, yelling, I love to kiss your stupid white ass! Give it to me! Never faster, I bolted for home like a hungry pony. <laughs> Yet I sparred with him on the playground, shrieked laughter, ran away, returned, could not find him, could not find him, could not find him. I asked the teacher, where did Ryan go? He was taken away. The teacher would not say where or how or who took him. I knew it was prison. They had taken him to prison because he frightened us sometimes, because he was big and Indian and swore a lot. I'm FBI, he said, a fucking big Indian. I tried to find out more. Stop being a busybody, another teacher told me, confirming my fears. He would never escape, or he would, and be angry at me, ten-year-old author of his fate. I had told on him once. I had feared and loved him without knowledge. Oh, Canada, are you my home and native land? I can't believe it. I love and fear you with a stranger's wise suspicion. I am a woman with a rusted key under her tongue. I dream in an ancient language, not this one. In this one, I know how to lie, how to remain silent while speaking. Come back to me, fields, river I knew before words could feed me. Return, old cottonwood of the child's mind, alley rocks in my pocket, the weasel head paths. I wandered as a girl hunting for frogs and found one in the pond mud, its throat round, shining, translucent with song. Sun heavy on my back, I crouched to watch the amphibian skin stretch, balloon, not break. I listened to that single proclamation, mine, 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 and remembered Ryan, Ryan of the Sarsi Reserve that bordered the parkland where I knelt. Was he there in the poplars, cursing, spitting spirit of the trees? Could he see me? My feet sank into the mud, as the frog's throat filled again, and his gold-flecked eyes stared past the skating, whirling lives of the water. Then he leapt through the lime-bright algae into his poisoned kingdom. And this is the last poem I'm going to read. It's called, O Canada. Again. O Canada, as sung in Calgary, Alberta. O Canada, with burning hearts we see the rise 
in the price of the old neighborhood by the river where my mom played as a kid. Grew up, married, the wrong man, a crook. Then, to increase her mistake exponentially and complicate my family tree, left him and married his brother. <laughs> daddy, daddy. He was more hardworking than the other, but equally ruinous. It's just too bad she didn't keep the house. It would be worth half a million now. True North strong, no longer free for the taking. No wonder we have to stand on guard in this town. Where there's money, there's a lack of it, and thieves. Who believes that Divino's bar once was a little place, bohemian yet elegant. Today it's buffed new and polished blunt. The light fixture cost 50 thou, and the wine list starts off don't ask me how, at 300 a bottle. That's true. But I used to nurse a tea bag there for hours without shame, across from a red-haired Englishman who taught me how to touch the flame that burns sapphire blue above Sambuca. Ah, the first time my very first, to see a floating coffee bean and quench my thirst with fire. Alcohol at last. But now I can't afford to be nostalgic by the glass. Perhaps, the ghost of my uncle quips, I should take out a quick loan and rip off a liquor store on my own, or play the VLTs, that's video lottery terminal until the cows come home. Just take a chance, like my dad who gave my inheritance, toonie by toonie, to the AGLC. That's the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission. No complaints for me, though I wish on my mother's grave that some of my father's cash could splash down helter-skelter into a food bank stash or a woman's shelter. Both proclaim their desperate need despite tons of oil and cattle feed. From far and wide, O oh Canada, and Calgary too, I have loved you desperately and departed. I can't remember. Can you remember? how this song started, and how does it end? Am I home for good or for bad? Home to stay and bury the hatchet, or dig it up and throw it? Here, catch it in your scarred hands. Catch it in that rotting treasure, the tarred and feathered oil sands. Catch it nimbly between your teeth. It's that trick with an axe that you taught me. Aka nada, aka nada, aka nada. And everything, kanata. Oh, Canada, what do you really mean? How can I sing you without lying?